Hello traders, this is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. At the end of this past week, as I often do, I looked back to see what kind of trading conditions we dealt with, uh, just to get a sense of the markets that were unfolding, where the focus has been, because that's often a guideline for where they're going to be in the week ahead and weeks ahead, uh, but also to take account of the kind of trading that I was doing to see if there were any errors or something I can improve upon, or maybe the conditions just weren't uh, right for the type of trading that I'm doing, which can also allow for some adjustment for those types of markets. Markets. Well, the thing that really stuck out to me in this review uh, was not the unusual nature of the market, which we talked about uh, as the week unfolded, but rather that I hadn't taken any trades this past week. In fact, my 2017 has been very light, uh, and the reason for that, uh, well, there are some contributions, multiple contributions, uh, but one of the primary considerations to this is I really haven't seen the convincing combination of, uh, of needs that I look for to verify trade setups. All right, so what I want to talk about in today's strategy, strategy video, this weekend strategy video, is revisiting a concept that I think is extraordinarily important, deciding when to stay out of the market. Now, there are two extremes uh, when it comes to participation in markets, and this is holding all the other factors aside. How in-depth the strategy do we have, the uh, considerations for risk management, and all those other variables uh, that go into a successful strategy, but holding those the same. When we talk about acti uh, activity in the market, not the volatility of the market itself, but rather are getting in and out, uh, it is dictated on a scale of uh, overtrading, so being just too active in the market when it really doesn't deserve it. Uh, that's ultimately when we get into a situation where we just take trades because we are trying to make up for losses or uh, we are trying to press a hot hand, which is more of a gambler's uh, approach, uh, or we just want to get back into trading and we don't really have a uh, clear bearing. We just execute, execute, execute. The other end of that spectrum is being gun shy, not knowing when to pull the trigger and staying to the sidelines forever because uh, you're just not in that exact comfort uh, uh, comfort zone to actually uh, get into the risk. Now this comes for other reasons. Uh, oftentimes after a series of losses, the uh, more uh, conservative personality would actually, instead of you know trying to trade back to where they started after a loss, uh, they will stay on the sidelines for an indefinite period. Or we've just been out for a while, we're not comfortable placing trades again because we can't really get back up to that uh, comfort zone. But the situation that I find myself in uh, is not, I think, at either of those extremes. Uh, these conditions are not uh, weighing in on my uh, trading approach and my decision not to get into any trades. And I've highlighted a number of uh, scenarios that I thought looked pretty good uh, over this past week, uh, but none of them really uh, fulfilled my expectations, the things that I was looking for to actually make them active trading setups. Now, one of the factors that is going into my decision or had gone into my decisions past week not to trade is that I do have considerable distractions. Personal life with anybody is going to get in the way. We can't all be automatons and, and machines and execute whenever the exact criteria are met because lots of things distract. Uh, and that has definitely factored into uh, my attention. But I have to say that uh, it's not that big of a factor. The crucial factor is I cannot get a good alignment of the kind of things that I find a, necess a necessity to actually take a trade. And when you don't find high-level conviction in markets, and it doesn't have to be, you know, a 90% confidence interval, uh, you being 90% uh, certain that the trade is going to play out in your, your uh, views, uh, there should never be 100, by the way. But at the same time, I need to have at least a considerable margin of ex acceptable uh, forecast or probability. Uh, I loosely uh, would say that qu qualitatively, not really quantitatively, uh, that I need at least a 60% uh, confidence interval that a trade is going to work out. Otherwise, I won't get in. Um, 
oftentimes I will make provisions for something along the lines of 50-50. 50-50 is a coin flip. And one might say, well, how can you get into a coin flip? That's, that's gambling. Uh, the probability that it works out uh, might be questionable. Uh, but if you have a, a skewed uh, scenario analysis, so let's say the S&P 500, which we're looking at here on a weekly chart, if we say that uh, the move to the upside is just as probable as move to the downside, which currently I don't think it is, but let's just say for hypothetical sake, uh, then a break to the upside is probably going to be really slow, conservative, and uh, struggling for momentum with lots of stops and starts. And there's plenty of time to get out, and uh, I don't think that it would uh, really ta uh, tally up big losses uh, really rapidly. But if there was a move to the downside, uh, it could unfold aggressively because of the speculative overreach that we've had in the markets, the complacency that has just been absolutely built in, and the general circumstance of conditions, not just the underlying fundamental uh, gap of value, which I think it, I have to uh, keep referring to this chart. Um, the risk-reward index in the S&P 500. That's just an enormous gap of value. You can say GDP, you can say price earnings, you can say uh, return on investment, you can say yield, dividend, or whatever you, you feel the value is. But I, I do think that this is overdone in a very serious way, such that if we start getting a move to the downside, it can easily shake loose complacency, and the exposure that already exists exiting the market can happen in a torrent. Building up exposure into long risk would happen at a trickle. Um, so 50-50 might not necessarily be a bad thing if you're talking about a dramatically skewed potential movement uh, like we're talking about here. That's that going back to that concept of probability versus potential that we've talked about time and time again over the past months and years. But I can see all this in terms of the range of probabilities. There are certain setups that I thought had uh, some attractive bearings to them. I mentioned the, uh, actually I like the Aussie Swiss all right, if you looked at the four-hour chart, you see a nice head and shoulders pattern there. Obviously, didn't uh, find follow-through. Uh, the same is true of the Aussie USD this past week, building up a head and shoulders pattern. And then the dollar yen, uh, which actually better viewed on the daily chart. Uh, I saw good potential there, but obviously didn't uh, force the break that I would have preferred, uh, more of a fundamental orientation towards risk aversion, because it would have to overcome a market that's not really... Uh, conducive to major breakouts with follow-through, much less trend development. And that is a stymie on a lot of markets. It's, it's going to be tough to get the dollar yen or the Oz USD to move. It's going to be tough to get the uh, S&P 500 or U.S. equities exposure to move. You can see we had a break this past week, but it went absolutely nowhere after one day a gap up. This is a universal uh, issue that we're facing because of the depths of complacency in these markets. But this also dictates to me that while it's not necessary for me to find a situation in which I have to have a trend, it's not like I need 500 pips, I don't need you know 20 uh, ETF index points, uh, I don't need a massive swing in oil, for example, to, to make it a viable trade. But what I do need is a combination of these factors to actually make it a, an appealing approach. I can adjust my uh, trading to be more short-term short -term oriented. And that usually means an emphasis on technicals, a clarity on fundamentals, uh, and less of a, uh, of a consideration for the underlying themes on the fundamental side, uh, but also an appreciation of those market conditions that uh, really curb it all. All right, it's not going to really turn into a major trend. It's probably going to stay more range-bound, or breakouts are going to have shorter duration. I can adjust for that, and I do. But that still means that I have to have uh, at least a bare minimum with those adjustments. So my orientation has been short term actually for a uh, better part of a year now, but I did not see a lot of the circumstances that would have supported such a short term setup. Now in these uh, conditions, in these markets, 
I am certainly aware of the market conditions that we are dealing with. Shorter term and certain and uh, a certain degree of skepticism about any kind of trend development because uh, it's really difficult to maintain. If it does uh, uh, end up happening, it's probably because we have a uh, consistent uh, development uh, that keeps tickling the markets higher or lower, which is really tough to do, to have uh, you know 10 different things that are uh, un unconnected to each other uh, actually all turn out to be exactly supportive of a, of a trend, which it's a very improbable uh, situation. And I don't look for such improbabilities. I'm looking for uh, what they call the fat pitch. I'm just looking for really easy, very clear, low-hanging fruit, and I, I don't want to have to try too hard and stretch the assumptions. But given the short-term duration and a greater influence or prominence of technicals, then I, in turn, need to have an appreciation of data. All right, The data has to be clear. Now, when I say data, I also mean event risk. So looking at the economic docket and what's on that docket, the listings I have to see are going to have to be relatively clear. They have to provide volatility in a uniform way, or they have to be non-existent and not near. However, in these types of circumstances where we're holding uh, to ranges a little bit better, we're going to need that kind of motivation to actually get moving. Now, if I'm looking at something like an uh, an Aussie Swiss, you know, let's go with the Aussie Swiss, uh, that's a move back into a range. But at the same time, I need to, on that four-hour chart, uh, get enough of a push to actually break support and make a follow-through move. All right, that means that uh, the CPI figures and the PPI figures, the all the inflation figures that we have from Australia last week, they would have to play a substantial role in motivating this, and it have to be pretty straightforward. Well, I was watching this very closely, and I was ready to take a trade. However, as it happened, the inflation figures were not uh, decisive enough to actually give us this break on these technical levels and make it follow through. All right? I wasn't looking for a move all the way down to the bottom of this larger wedge formation, which would take it all the way down to approximately 73.20, which have been a, a pretty impressive 300 pip move. Uh, but rather, I was looking at uh, looking at it as an opportunity for something on, on the order of 75 to 100 pips. But that didn't even happen because we didn't have the necessary fundamental components uh, to give the push. And subsequently, those technicals, which are pretty clear, which is what happens in markets that aren't really driven by uh, strong trend orientation or clear high profile themes, um, would just trickle through those technical boundaries and not give us that trade opportunity that we were looking for. For something like the dollar yen, I was definitely keeping a very close eye on this pair uh, and looking for a decisive uh, move. Uh, well, the technical boundaries wouldn't break. I guess you could say it, it did ultimately offer a good range opportunity all right, between 115.50 and 112.50, uh, but it was an under constant jeopardy uh, from an orientation on risk trends. All right, This uh, certainly deviated uh, for certain periods of time from risk uh, in other asset classes like the S&P 500. Uh, we also had a constant barrage of uncertainty with the U.S. dollar. Anything dollar-based was going to be a struggle this past week because we looked not at the data that we had on the docket, and we had some noteworthy ones. Uh, we had, uh, you know, uh, monetary policy speak. Uh, we had the high profile stuff uh, like the US GDP figures at the end of the week. Uh, I mean, these were very sensible, very clear uh, catalysts if they were going to offer that kind of impact, but they didn't because we were instead focusing on the clearly unknown and very erratic updates that we get on uh, U.S. trade policy from the new uh, U.S. president. And that becomes something that we can't really uh, factor in for. We can't account for that in a probabilistic way because the updates come randomly and the back and forth is uh, seemingly very consistent. Not only uh, that, but the markets are uh, consistently adapting uh, to how, Im how much influence they're actually willing to afford these events these updates from uh, President Trump. So it, in essence, makes it very difficult to have the clarity necessary to drive the dollar to a significant move and actually carry through with it. Now, the fact that we don't know when something's going to happen, and then when it does, the market's questioning how much consistency it has, that creates for very difficult trading conditions. 
All right. So the market that we're dealing with now is certainly more volatile, all right, even though the volatility indicators are extraordinarily low, which is a, an issue in all into itself. The technicals are given a little bit better precedence, but the event risk is significantly limited. And it is proving less of a docket item with good consistency. I, it's not like I can just say, oh, well, here's a event coming out at, uh, let's say, 1330 GMT. I can just uh, prepare for its release. Here's a scenario if it comes out this way. Here's a scenario if it comes out that way. I'm only looking for a reserved, let's say, 75 pips over the span of three hours, and then uh, a stage the setup. Given the erratic nature of these markets and the kind of the adaptations that we have, it becomes much more difficult. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible uh, to trade for these kind of con conditions. You can, absolutely. Uh, but you have to be on a far more shorter duration to be uh, more aligned to intraday scalping or uh, let's say even uh, the pure scalping, which is uh, seconds. Um, and But I've uh, left that behind a number of years ago. Uh, or you have to really be big picture thematic trading, uh, but that entails uh, just setting trades so that you expect to unfold over the big over the long term eventually. And I care a little bit too much about timing to just throw caution to the wind and uh, trade such massive themes. So in the meantime, I'll continue to apply the analysis I'm looking for. I know what conditions I want. Uh, pairs like the Euro USD. All right, if you look at the uh, four hour chart, I like that wedge, but I need something that actually fulfills uh, the opportunities that it represents. Uh, I like the pound dollar, but I need to make sure that the data that we have on the docket coming week, we have a lot of it, uh, non-farm payrolls, FOMC, Bank of England, debate over Brexit. But how much of that is also going to be influenced by the unknown factor of Donald Trump and how much of that weight from the pound side is going to uh, fold over to the Be Brexit discussion versus the Bank of England's efforts? It remains to be seen. Unless I see these conditions actually fully align, I'm not going to take a trade just because I'm antsy uh, as I've been out of the market. Uh, I'm going to maintain that necessity. There are limitations to how much I'm willing to adapt uh, my own trading approach uh, to make it more suitable for the markets. When the adaptation requires me to uh, follow illogical setups or throws uh, all probability out the window, then it's probably not going to be very successful. So I will uh, set my cap on willingness to adapt. Um, but I'll continue to look for those high probability steps, knowing that I'm still looking for uh, short-term trading, technical orientation, more uh, looking for the straightforward data rather than the ambiguous theme, uh, like a, a Brexit or a U.S. trade policy kind of motivation. Uh, and uh, I'm certainly going to keep uh, uh, still a close, close eye on those big build-up themes that have great potential but pro that just haven't played out. All right, risk trends being at the very top of that list. We'll wrap it up here. We'll do our next strategy video next week. Until then, I wish you good luck trading out there.